People do what they want to do. Well, let me remind all of us, myself included, you can't serve two masters. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, nobody can serve two masters. For either will hate the one and love the other, or else they'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot love God and mammon. Mammon just being a, an autonomy for self or money. So which one is more important to your kids, heaven or hate? And, and by that I mean, if I were to offer them a 5,000 square foot house, three car garage, new cars inside, boat out back, is that more enticing than the prospect of heaven? Which one more does and does? We talked on Friday night about covetousness being idolatry. Remember what Paul said, Colossians 3, covetousness, which is idolatry. Do we have a problem with that in the United States? If I were to say keeping up with uh, you, fill in the blank, can't you? Jones is right. <laughs> My generation, we perfected it. We wanted to start our marriages with everything it had taken our parents 20 years to amass. We wanted a washer and dryer, a house full of furniture, closet full of clothes, two cars out back. We bought every bit of it on credit. And then marriages started to crumble under financial strain. And all of a sudden we realized we can't give anything to the church because we don't have it. But we could show sure keep up with the Joneses, couldn't we? Well, church, listen to me. The Joneses are bankrupt and their kids are lost. We got to reset our priorities. I don't want anybody to leave in this morning thinking that this hurdle is too high. How do we save our kids? How, how do we make sure everybody in this room makes it to heaven? Very quickly, number one, we got to fill them with Bible knowledge. We got to make sure they're in the book. Outside of this building. We also have to prepare for combat. We've got to stop acting like. Just because we live in Richmond Hill. Or Savannah area. That everything is going to be okay. Number three. We've got to protect our hearts and our minds. I'm putting that one mainly. On the shoulders of the dads in this room. Number four. We've got to train them up. In the nurture. And the admonition of the Lord. Number five. We've got to teach them a proper portrait. Of who God really is. And number six, we've got to model. Notice I say model and not just tell them the proper priorities of life. I had a, a really sweet lady one time who wrote in my very first leather Bible, I was 16, she put on the inside cover, get into this book until it gets into you. I, I didn't appreciate it at 16. I appreciate it a whole lot more today. Can we honestly say, church, as Joshua did, choose for your house this day whom you'll serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You'll see me get fired up. You invite me to come over to your house. Have that on your wall all the while Desperate Housewives is on the television. That'll get me fired up. Because that's blasphemy, folks. We've got to make sure our young people understand there really is going to be a judgment day. You know, yesterday we talked about the fact that hell is real. And there's going to be many people that go there. Last but not least, we've got to make them crave heaven more than anything else. I've been issuing a challenge all across the United States, and I'm going to do the same here this morning. <coughs> Almost every church has a couple of things that are kind of staples. One of them is a statistics board. We find them just about in every congregation. You know, we, we record our, our numbers. Sometimes we put our budgetary stuff on there. This morning, I want you to consider adding a, a new line to that statistic board that says souls lost to the world. Your challenge is to keep that at zero for one year. Because can you imagine walking into this building, looking up, and all of a sudden that number jumped up to two or three, and suddenly you realize people in this very room have gone off into the world. <clears throat> That's your challenge. It's yours. Now, before you can accept the challenge, you've got to first ask yourself, am I really a New Testament Christian? 
Have I done what the Bible says? This morning during Bible class, we proved that the Bible is inspired. Now you've got to ask yourself, have I obeyed? If you're here and you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, for my sins, you're ready to change your life, to repent, to confess his name before men so that one day he will confess you. If you're ready to be immersed for the remission of your sins, you can walk out of this place a child of God. And again, I'm going to ask, what are you waiting for? Your young people, if you're wise enough, old enough to realize, I've done some things that God is not proud of. There's only one person who can fix that. And that's you. However, for those of us who are Christians, if you were paying attention to me, I started this lesson telling you I was going to give you seven reasons why we're losing our kids. I only gave you six, didn't I? The seventh is what's going to keep some of you in your seats in just a moment. The seventh, even though deep down you realize, I do probably need to make some changes, that seventh is called apathy. And it is one of Satan's greatest weapons. If he can get you to stay in that rut and to stay in that seat and to hold on to that pew for all it's worth, he's got you right where he wants you. Well, this morning, I'm begging you to cast off the shackles of apathy and to show your children that their soul is more valuable than that and to do what you need to do. If you are here, you need to rededicate yourself, whatever it is. I recognize that stepping out is not a popular thing, but folks, again, I'll meet you halfway if it means getting our kids to heaven. If you're here and you realize that you need make some changes, rededicate yourself <clears throat> and ask for prayers from this congregation. I'm begging you, please come as together we stand up and we sing.